and keep it rolling. And there's not a whole lot of like, I don't want to edit as much as possible. Like I don't want to edit. Um, like what we At did. what point what should did. I break into song? Because I do that <laughs> about 13 minutes in. 13 <laughs> minutes in. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit. And before we kick off the show, let's go through a little bit of the news. Now, we are entering the release season, the fall release season, which every bourbon nerd goes crazy about. And we've talked about Booker's 30th on the podcast before, but there's two of them that have kind of been the hypes of this past week. And the first one is that everybody has started getting their media samples of the Heaven Hill 27-year-old release. Now, when I say everybody, that means everybody except Bourbon Pursuit somehow. I don't know how it happens, but apparently we're not on the Heaven Hill mailing list. I'll have to figure out if I know somebody that works there. But in regards to the release, it looks like it's getting positive vibes around everywhere. Some people say it's a little too oaky for the palate. Um, Some people say it's right on point. I like a little bit of oak, so I'm hoping I'm going to like it. But if you want to read more, go check out Fred Minnick's review on fredminnick.com to see if it's going to be worth your $400. And that's even if you can even find it. And speaking of Fred, congrats to him on his latest book, Mead, which is being reviewed by the New York Times. So you can go and check it out there. And that's a huge accomplishment. So congrats, Fred, on making that happen. In other release news, Old Forester Birthday Bourbon release has some interesting nuggets this year as well. It was bottled at the new Old Forester Distillery downtown, which we've talked about before. It's an amazing experience. It is a small batch bourbon that's been selected from a single day of production. There is a total of 120 barrels. They were distilled on June 9th, 2006. And this year, the total yield for all of those barrels was just shy of 40%, and five barrels were found to be completely empty. This is gonna be bottled at the highest proof that they've done, which is 101, and it's gonna have a retail price of $99, which is seemingly creeping up every single year, but with supply and demand, really nobody should be surprised. But the good news is that there's gonna be somewhere around 14,400 bottles that are gonna be available nationwide or wherever you can get them and from previous years. Now, if you are interested in helping support the show and you wanna partner with us and you wanna reach a wide audience that just loves to drink bourbon, send us an email, team at bourbonpursuit.com and we can talk about partnership opportunities or you can go to bourbonpursuit.com, hit the partnerships button at the very top and we've got a new media sheet that you can go look at as well. Last week, Ryan, myself and four other Patreon supporters picked out a barrel of Elijah Craig at Heaven Hill. We did have a great experience going through the selection process and taking a tour of the facility. Now back to the selection process, we had the choice of either eight, nine, or an 11 year old barrel, and they were all done blind. And of course, as I'd mentioned, I love oak, and people love that dark, rich complexity that it brings. We selected the 11 year barrel, and the icing on the cake was that this was from Parker's favorite warehouse in Deetsville, which was warehouse EE. Now, this barrel, from what we could tell, was unlike any other that we had been able to see before because the bands on those barrels had ZZ on them, which if you're familiar with Independent Stave, they usually have either a KY or an MO to depict on where they were built at. So we have no idea where this barrel came from. And the wood grain on it was unlike anything other as well. It was super tight. And one thing that Ryan loved is that it also had a good amount of funk that was built up on it. You could kind of scrape it and just see a bunch of dirt built up. So seeing that good funk is always great. Now, it was almost really too easy to, to see the color differences between the 8, 9, and 11 years, but we did our best to try to go blind with it. And if you recall, last year's Parker's Heritage release was an 11 year from the same exact warehouses. So perhaps we got one of those barrels that were left around to just mature another year. But the worst part of this is that we had to proof this beauty down to 94. We would give almost anything to make sure that we could get this at barrel proof. But as one of our supporters pointed out, we basically picked out a poor man's Parker's Heritage Promise of Hope, which if you remember, that was a few releases ago, and this is gonna be at two proof points lower, one year older, and from the same exact warehouse, EE. You can read the entire story on our Patreon page and you can see why this pick has been dubbed Pump the Brakes. And you can also see pictures of William Heaven Hill's gravesite 
And you can go to our Facebook page where we got a chance to see Heaven Hill's barrel rolling team practicing for the Kentucky Bourbon Festival's barrel rolling competition. And we had the Evan Williams Bourbon Experience Artisanal Stiller, Jody Filiatro, as their keeping time. And as usual, if you want to get in on one of these bottles, support the show on Patreon. And once again, thanks to Keg and Bottle, K-E-G-N-B-O-T-T-L-E, for making this happen out of the San Diego area. Or you can go check them out online. Now... Ryan and I, we pride ourselves on being able to spot a pretty good single barrel every once in a while. But like all single barrel picks, you have the, your choice is really only as good as the barrels that are rolled out on that day. Now, I'm not going to ruin it for you, but we had a great time putting our single barrel BT pick up against the fellas from Bluegrass Bourbon Trade or otherwise known as BB&T, which is a local Kentucky group if you're not familiar with it. Now, one good challenge that you can do for yourself at home is to get a standard bottle of an offering and pair it with a single barrel version of it. You can try them just side by side. This is going to be a great way for you to see how much single barrels can vary. And also, never let those stickers fool you, but they are all fun and part of the FOMO process. Now, if you like what you hear, subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can watch the podcast on YouTube and you can like us on Facebook to get all those new posts. And if you want the full show notes with links and pictures, visit bourbonpursuit.com and sign up for our email list. And if you like to scroll through Instagram or read tweets, make sure you follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Bourbon Pursuit. And if you do support us on Patreon and you hit your six months at this point, shipments are finally in the mail and you might be receiving them uh, today or tomorrow. And we also did our giveaway too. Uh, if you support the show at $5 or more per month on Patreon, we do a giveaway every single month. And this month was uh, some good Four Roses gear. So uh, congrats to our winners for that too. And if you do support the show, patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit is where you do it. We've got hats or no, we got patches that you can put on hats. We've got t-shirts, we've got bottle totes, we've got koozies, we've got access to barrel picks and even the opportunity to join us on a barrel pick as well. With that, enjoy this week's episode, and here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. By now, you've likely become your friend and family's bourbon expert. They reach out to you wanting to know the best bourbon to buy for the holidays and ask the typical questions such as, what's the difference between bourbon and whiskey? And perhaps the greatest misnomer of them all, does bourbon have to be made in Kentucky? That's a question I get a lot, and usually people are in awe when they learn bourbon can be made in New York or New Mexico, and the bourbon is not just made in Kentucky. But occasionally, people object to these facts. Once while presenting to a room full of people, an elderly lady muscled through the crowd. She walked with a cane and a slight limp. Her flowered dress hovered just above her ankles. She looked like a lovely great-grandma. As she reached me, I felt bad she walked all that way just to talk to me and thought I should have met her halfway. But then she spoke. You got it wrong, boy, she said. I'm sorry, ma'am, I replied. Bourbon's got to be made in Kentucky. No, ma'am, I said. In 1964, Congress declared bourbon a unique product of the United States, not just Kentucky. She then poked me in the chest, looked me straight in the eye through her clouded glasses and said, get your facts right, boy. She's not the only older lady who's threatened me over bourbon's definition. For some reason, Kentucky's geriatric community really has a thing for protecting Kentucky bourbon. Interestingly, they're not the only ones spreading this myth that bourbon must be made in Kentucky. But where does it come from? I'm fascinated to learn where these myths originate. Yes, something like 90 to 95% of the country's bourbon is made in Kentucky, and its history is deeply rooted in the bluegrass state. But there was also a time the federal court system recognized bourbon as uniquely Kentucky. During an early 1900s Pure Food and Drug Act libel case, federal attorneys argued a Louisiana distiller had libeled the government's law by labeling blackstrap molasses as bourbon. Among the evidence the judge accepted was that bourbon had to be made in Kentucky. I believe this case emboldened Kentucky to further own the bourbon brand of whiskey. 
But as strong bourbon interests grew in Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and Maryland, this Kentucky-only sentiment faded on a national level. In the 1930s, the United States required a state of distillation to be listed on the bottle. They didn't want somebody buying New York bourbon, after all, and thinking it was from Kentucky. Furthermore, Kentucky has always, always mocked other states for their bourbon efforts. Even today, Governor Matthew Bevan says 95% of the world's bourbon comes from Kentucky, and the rest is counterfeit. So you can understand why people spread the Kentucky misnomer. But let's be honest. For us grizzled bourbon veterans, this question does get old. But we have to remember, too, that we bear the bourbon knowledge. And with that comes great responsibility. We occasionally get an old lady walking up to us, poking us in the chest, and wanting to kick our ass. We just got to be bigger. And that's this week's Above the Char. If you want to learn more about bourbon's history, check out my book, Bourbon, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of an American Whiskey. Got an idea for me? Reach out on Twitter or Instagram, at Fred Minnick. That's at Fred Minnick, F-R-E-D-M-I-N-N-I-C-K. Until next week, cheers. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or TheBourbonConcierge.com, and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, the memory game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout, and if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to NoseYourBourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Ryan on the road today in Nicholasville, yes. Kentucky. Um, yeah. Actually at an <laughs> establishment of somebody we had on the show quite some time ago uh, when we talked about cigars, right? That was a great episode too. Yeah, it was hotter than shit. And, uh, <laughs> it <laughs> we, was. Were, we were drinking bourbon and, oh, hey, sorry, I forgot we were on uh, <laughs> We were on social Facebook media. Live, but we're all, we're all yeah, it, only took, it only took me a minute to screw that up, but uh, 
No, yeah, happy to be here because that episode was great, you know, hanging out with Jake and Jeremy, and I'm so glad they invited us down here to Nicholasville to hang out and record. This is this is our recording studio yeah. for the day, right? Absolutely. I mean, but today is our, today's topic is always one that is fascinating because, you know, we've we've talked about it plenty of times. We've we've you know, Blake has made it famous and said like always try blind, right? And yep. today is really going to be about um, looking at things from a blind perspective. Um, it's always, it's also going to be looking at store picks, right? Yeah. Um, comparing store picks to one another. Um, you know, we're going to be looking at a, uh, a store pick that hit ultimate heights on the <laughs> secondary market and kind of really see like, does it stack up against other ones as well? Right. Yeah, it made Buffalo Trace a uh, store pick like wall of legends, you know? So <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, blind is super important, especially in these, cause we picked one barrel, they picked one. So we're like. Out the gate, you're like, mine's better. So, <laughs> even if it's not better. Every, everybody's going to have a little bit of bias to it, right? But I right. think it's going to be an interesting kind of take just to, you know, figure this out. And, you know, we're going to we're gonna learn a lot of stuff in the process, too. So with that, let's go ahead and introduce our guests. So today on the show, we have Ben Pickett and Paul Warnut. These fellas are part of a barrel picking group. They're also admins of a particular Facebook group that begins with the word bluegrass. <laughs> um, maybe they'll go through some rebranding at some point. Who knows what that looks like? Uh, if you want to find out more about getting into the group, I guess start looking through your friends or friends of friends of our group and you can get your way in. But gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you for having Thank us. you. Yeah. So, you know, before we start kicking this off, I kind of want to talk about just blind tasting because this was something that um, you know, Paul, you had talked to me about, you said, you know, come here, like, let's do a blind tasting together. Like, what was your, what was your real motivation behind it? Uh, well, these, these picks, uh, specifically, uh, one of them, um, was super short barrel. Um, so not a whole lot of people were going to get to try it. Um, so I wanted to, to get it to you so you can, you know, taste it and, and tell everybody kind of what all the, the hype was about. Um, and our other picks that, w- that we've been doing, um, they, I don't know. Maybe we just got lucky, um, but <laughs> but they were they all sold out in just you know a matter of hours, and you know that kind of puts pressure on us as a group. But it also um, you know could kind of puts us on the map a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. What about you, Ben? I mean, when you when you think about um, you know how much or how fast you know your group is selling through bottles, because let's put it this way, right? I mean, you you get a barrel, and we'll say it's a we'll say it's a nice barrel. It's got 185 bottles. Uh, sure. You get a group with a thousand people in it, like. I mean, at some point, like you can't really be too far to say like, oh, well, it's not like we didn't expect that to happen. Right. Mm-hmm. You know? Sure. Well, um, you know, where we are doing them, you know, some barrel picking groups, obviously pre-sell everything. And so it's a matter of like first come to post, give me a bottle goes. And then there's kind of allocation. Uh, we go through a retailer. So it is kind of retail style. We announce it's out. So where we do have over a thousand members, we don't have a thousand people you know, right. within a couple mile radius. Uh, so it creates a mad rush because people that are members and we have members that are calling friends from other side of the state, trying to get somebody to the actual store. Cause you have a small window. We kind of talked about if we want to change it. Cause obviously we want members to get to try uh, barrels that we've picked and we have more members than bottles. Of course, like with any other bourbon group, your active base is a lot different than your roles as a total group. So, I mean, I, we have a significant size local group, but you know, our core of really active people is significantly smaller. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as far as, you know, what goes with tasting these, I mean, we get uh, our core group of people go and picks. Our admin team uh, goes on all the barrel picks, and then we bring in different members uh, to help select them. Uh, so they're kind of like little cheerleaders of every barrel, too, talking about them. Uh, but it you know kind of spreads the experience for everybody, and we've been fortunate enough to I mean, get some great barrels, and uh, hopefully you'll agree when you taste a couple of them here in a minute. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I think you got our sloppy seconds from our pick. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I guess uh, another part of that, um, you know, first off, you know, I guess being admins, you're a little spoiled, right? Because you said you get to go on every single pick, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that's that's pretty awesome. I think we should start a group then. We oh, should no. we should just do that. So we're always on the, the always in the barrel picks. I'm in. <laughs> We got to find that store. Yeah. Well, it has, um, certainly has some perks, but it's also a big time commitment. I mean, not all barrel picks are glamorous. Uh, you know, some of them might be sending you samples and tasting and trying to pick, or you might go one day and the, the barrels they roll out don't rock your world. You know, yeah. there's, I think people think, I mean, obviously if you go pick a, a Russell's barrel, you can taste barrels until you find what you want for the most part. It's mm-hmm. very hard to not get a barrel you're happy with if you go pick Russell's. Uh, some of the programs are going to lay out three barrels. 
Yeah. And, you know, you're just hoping that one of the three barrels they gave you are good. Um, but when it comes to after, I mean, we also try to help our store owner that works with us. We want to make sure the barrels are successful. That's why we come up with themes and stickers and labels. And that's part of obviously what caused one of our picks to uh, rise to a different level. Just people love marketing. We didn't intend for anything like that. It was more fun for the group. Mm -hmm. um, the name of the, the barrel was after the actual picking experience as people got a little tipsy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we just you know kind of went with that theme. Uh, but we try to theme most of our, our barrel picks now with some type of label or sticker. Helps them. Most of us have substantial collections. So if you look on the shelf, it's easier to pick out a bottle that has a sticker on it mm -hmm. than flipping through 40 name tags on mm -hmm. the bottles. Well, and you made a good point too. I think we met last week about the Russell's picks, how they have the tag you can just slip on over it, the the bottles. So this kind of helps, you know, put a brand on that specific bottle. Absolutely. I mean, you hate to think that people would consider, you know, faking a bottle and taking the neck tag off of a pick and putting it on a uh, off the shelf bottle. But I mean, we've had issues in the bourbon community and wine communities and everything else where people do fake yeah. bottles. And so having a secondary label protects the people that are collecting uh, to know they're getting what was intended. Uh, but we talked about that from another Russell's pick that got a lot of um, appreciation raised to probably new heights for a Russell's barrel was selling for $250, $300. And, uh, but there was people accusing guys of selling a fake bottle because it had the hang tag, but without the sticker. And mm -hmm. um, now I am actually one of the guys that bought a case of that barrel that weren't stickered. <laughs> so I know that obviously there, there's some, out there's there, some yeah. out there that that's a true story, but how, I mean, how do you know? And if you're going to spend that much money over retail, I mean, you'd kind of like to know that yeah. you're getting what you're, you're buying. So I think it, it's, it's good for collectability. It's also good to protect people. I feel confident if, if somebody that's not in our local group wants one of our picks, they have to buy it from a member pretty much. Mm -hmm. Or if somebody had to have told them it was at the store and they got in there before members bought them all. Um, so for outside people to try our barrels, we, we want them to get, the actual bottle. Mm -hmm. You know, if you try our pick and you think it's terrible and we find out it wasn't even our pick because somebody just switched an egg tag, <laughs> I don't want that judgment. Right. You know, I don't want that on me. So yeah. I guess Paul, I guess what do you what do you guys see as like the way to help spread this love amount amongst all the members? I mean, are you trying to say like, you know, limit one per person or like, you know, like it's the stores, it's up to the store's MO of whatever they want to do? Like what what do you usually do to try to Sometimes, members. sometimes like uh, like the OKI that was super short or whatever, we did limit those to one. Um, but if there's, you know, a, a high yield or if he buys two barrels or, or whatever, then, you know, we just announce it and they come in and, and get them. Mm -hmm. Just kind of free for all at that point, That's right? It, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's let's move on to this first. Like, so, by the way, this is uh, completely blind tasting, but we have in front of us, we, we all have three glasses. They are marked. Uh, Jeremy has done a great job of putting a letter. So we got W, V, and U on the bottom of them. And we're just going to kind of go through and I guess give – ideas or tasting notes so I, are we drinking the same letter at the same time or just well I'm, I'm assuming i have no idea i'm assuming that this is blind it's blind uh but it could be three buffalo traces it could be three different russell's <laughs> reserves it could be two buffalo traces one russell's reserve. i don't really know what it is but um jeremy's part is we're at the mercy of jeremy we're at the so mercy of jeremy right now so <laughs> he's funny these are all kentucky gentlemen <laughs> <laughs> okay. all right so let's grab w and kind of just like Give initial thoughts about it real quick. Um, I think it smells good. Mm -hmm. it smells like bourbon. <laughs> it smells like bourbon. <laughs> right about that. Yeah. I mean, so when you guys are tasting at home, I mean, are you guys trying it in rock classes? Are you guys trying to do it in like actual like Glen Cairns or Snifters or something like that? Because you can definitely tell there's a, a different way to be able to try to nose and get flavors out of a rocks glass versus something different, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, a bourbon glass, uh, a Snifter is normally what I'm going to prefer. Um, I think that people, obviously, the whole point is it collects the aroma in that smaller top after the bulbous bottom. So people sometimes don't pay attention to what it's for. It's not to look pretty. It's actually to help with the nose, which helps with the flavor. And that's the whole purpose. Mm -hmm. So that was like, that was pretty creamy. A little spice in the end. A lot of spice at the end, mm -hmm. yeah. You feel the, good, the rye notes at the end. Good, good typical, you know, bourbon, caramel, vanilla, toffee, whatever kind of flavors you get on the, on the palate. But... It does kind of stick. It lingers it's a long on the finish. finish. Yeah, it yeah, it's got a nice, hot finish, spicy. Yeah. Not it's that hot, Kentucky but... hug that Jimmy loves. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to V since I, I had I had a taste of that one already. Um, kind of just keep this rolling on because Jeremy just keeps bringing glasses over. So we got <laughs> we got to figure out what this is gonna look like, right? And figure out how we're gonna get home. 
<laughs> oh, well, I think we'll now we're good. <laughs> and so I, I guess, um, you know, Paul, also when you're going into a blind testing, uh, you know, tasting, is there anything that you're trying to keep top of mind or trying mm. to think about like, um, you know, <clears throat> whether are there certain notes you're trying to pull out? Like what's, what's sort of your mentality going into? Like in a blind tasting or a barrel pick? A blind tasting, what we're doing right now. The, the blind tastings, man, I always just try to go for what I like. You know, mm. I've never been, you know, one of those people that, you know, gets off on the, this is off profile. This is, you know, you know, X, Y, Z. I just like the old rustic, like you can taste the history in the, in the juice. And that's what, that's what I like. So Mm -hmm. I usually try to pick something that I enjoy. You know, most of the people that, you know, I've had the pleasure of drinking with share the same opinions uh, as far as what they like in their bourbon. And so when I try to, you know, go through a blind, I just choose what I like. Okay. So you've had, uh, ben, you've had W and V so far. So what's what's your do you have a you have a preference so far? Uh, v is lighter up front. It's a little sweeter, I think, on the front, yeah. and the spice doesn't come in nearly as hard. It yeah. still has a a good finish on it, but it's hard. Uh, I'm actually get you hand me one of those waters. To help. Uh, I'm gonna give v, another it sip. Seem it. like a like a thicker texture to it too. It's well. real oily. Yeah, real yeah. oily. Yeah, well. I actually had to go back to W because V was the first taste of bourbon for the day for me. So. Um, I don't know how much you guys have been preparing for this, but you know, we've first, been here since 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to I had to kind of go back and like I was like, OK, I see what you're saying, because at first it was like very like creamy. And then I go back. I'm like, OK, there's the spice because now it actually like warmed my tongue up a little yeah. bit. Right. So I can definitely see that now I got to go back to V. Uh, Paul, what are your initial thoughts between W and V? Uh, v was a lot lighter. You know, uh, W, I felt like had a a lot more spice and mm-hmm. the, the finish was a lot longer on W, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, V's more approachable for, you know, like say somebody was getting into it, that would be a much more approachable bourbon for someone to try. Yeah, I agree. But me, I like the big bold finishes, so. <laughs> As do I. That's what she said. Yeah, All right, so said. so let's try you now. Let's let's move on to you. It's, it's actually, I don't know, um, I'll, I'll defer to somebody else if they can try to pick up different nosing um, you know, characteristics they can get out of it. Um, I don't know. For me, I'm just trying to keep the conversation going, so it's hard to uh, pay attention a little bit to the the different uh, aromas that are coming out. Uh, you know, Ben or Paul, is there you know, something? So I get rose water, almond extract, dark cherries. <laughs> ro- no, I'm, I'm, re- I'm reading a Fred Minnick review. Yeah, <laughs> from, that's that's exactly it. from Whiskey Advocate. I'm, when I read these reviews of people, I'm like, Good Lord, how do they get this? I mean. I've never been that There's guy. There's 30 yeah. different uh, 30 different names. And I'm, sure. like, I'm like, did he go to the dessert bar at Go Golden Corral? You know, just, <laughs> just got to get um, at one of everything. Some cherry cobbler. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I, sometimes you pick out notes that are unique. I mean, obviously, you always you recognize your normal notes to you. I mean, in what is in your sensory? I mean, that's where they have those sensory labs at the distilleries is they want to isolate those notes so that they can pick them out. I mean, we don't sit in sensory labs. We drink bourbon. And so yeah. we're smelling them all together. So it's harder to always identify. And everybody, I mean, you notice when you catch a banana or when you get real nutty or, you know, mint even are ones that you know, yeah. really pick up. But mm-hmm. on these, I mean, I've just got, you know, you get that caramel vanilla, I mean, baking spice. I mean, nothing really out of the ordinary on the, right. the nose on these. Yeah. And the, this one for me, I mean, my first, so like, uh, the first one, I guess, was a lot of spice. The second one, you know, was very easy, approachable, too sweet, not a lot of finish. This third one to me is like, feels like a perfect balance of sweet on the front end and spicy on the back end. Like, you know, that that's... I was about to say, I was like, <laughs> I think you might be my favorite out of yeah. all three. Yeah, me too. I don't know what you all feel. I uh, feel like it's a co- combination of V and W together. I agree. Yeah. yeah, it's a nice blend between them. I think that's something that people sometimes take for granted. I think you hear people talk about um, the first time they taste something, maybe how they didn't care for it and they let air get to it. I think people underestimate how other things they taste influence their palate. Mm-hmm. So tasting these three together, you is benefiting from the fact that it has a little bit of both, right. V and W. Right. But on its own, if we taste it on a different occasion, we might have completely different notes. Yeah, because comparing it. it to something else. Yeah, I mean, that's that we've talked about in the show before. I think that's one thing that we get – a little hung up on is, you know, when you actually at the barrel pick and you're going through it and you're saying like, oh, but you have the, the Rick house around, you have the smell, yeah. you have the aromatics and they, they and you're all hyper because alter- you're picking a barrel. Yeah. And they, <laughs> they, they alter that sensation, but you're still, a, it's a fun time. Right. Oh, yeah. um, so I think, um, 
go ahead and get your your final sips, and then we'll we'll make a a judgment on on who's who's got the the favorite here. I'm going back. Tried tried W again. Got that spice. Try and V again. A little more mellowed out. Yeah, it's, but after the second one, I V almost tastes a little tastes pretty good. I mean, we, I know it's funny visiting revisiting the first one. I'm like, well, maybe I like that one a little better, <laughs> but. Hmm. All right, and I'll try you one last time. I still think you's my favorite of the three. Yeah, use use it for me. I mean, it's funny after having you, it brought out a little bit better characteristics than the other one, but you still it for me. I mean, it does. It comes in very nice. The finish is great. Yeah, uh, you know, Ben or Paul. I mean, do you think trying these in a particular order could skew it as well? To say that, you know, if we, if we would have tried you first rather than W, like it could. Well, I think absolutely, but when you're talking about, like, what did we all say about W? Spice. Yeah. Well, so inherently a sweeter one is extra sweet after you started right. with spice. Mm-hmm. I mean, would we have gone the other way and said, you know, too sweet and then like a nice amount of spice? Had we gone the exact opposite? Maybe. Mm-hmm. I mean, how, you, you can't go back and redo it at the same <laughs> now. I mean, we can keep taking We can reset. Going. Yeah, <laughs> but it's not that easy, you know, to change your mind right. after you started. And yeah. I mean, I always think that the first pour is always kind of spicy because right. you've got to mm-hmm. acclimate. So what, I mean, when we've gone back through, it still is the spiciest of the three. Yeah. But it doesn't taste as spicy now as that very first pour did. And I think that's, right, you know, right. that's just, you've got to acclimate a little bit to what you're drinking. Yeah. Uh, but I think, I mean, the sweetness and the finish on you is great. I just ate a piece of pie before I came here. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all three my, of these my are. My palates are pretty sweet. I mean, I think that does have a lot to do with it too. Like I've told my wife several times coming home from here, from Jake's, uh, everything always tastes better when you drink it here because you have the smoke in the air yeah. and, you know, the, you're just talking the about bourbon and, Yeah, it's yeah. just, there's music going and, you know, whereas you're sitting, uh, you know, in your sweatpants on your couch, and, you know, it's you're like, right. oh, this is okay, but everything tastes really good in this building for some reason. All right, so All right. Jeremy, I think, let, we're, I think we're ready for the reveal. We're ready for the reveal. Let so, us know. So, but before we do the reveal, um, we just found out that these are all Russell Reserve barrel picks, right? Um, the there are three different ones. Um, I know two of them what they're going to be. At, at least, at least I know one of them is what we brought, which was <laughs> Jimmy's Guard Shack. What was done on a prior episode that we had done. Uh, with Ed Bly and uh, Reed and Emerald and some other people, right? Yep. So, um, what's your running order? Well, uh, so West let's, Virginia we're, University is where we're at. Yeah, right West, yeah WVU. So, yeah. what was W? W is Jimmy Guards. <laughs> was Jimmy's Guard Shack? Yeah. Okay, so that was kind of like dead last almost, right? <laughs> yeah, it kind of had a lot of good stuff to it. V was V is bluegrass berries. Bluegrass okay. berries, and okay. so this was uh, one another, we picked. Another mm-hmm. another private pick of yours. Yep. Kind of kind of talk about that one a little bit because tell this story. Yeah, yeah. So when we got out there, I mean, you've you've picked at Russell's. I mean, anybody that's never gone, that's that should be on your bucket list because yeah. Eddie just rolls out barrels from every rick house, and you really, I mean, he he stops you after maybe seven or eight and says, "Have you got something that you kind of like, or you have a direction?" Because he can take you from there. And, I mean, he knows the profile of every warehouse, which is incredible. Because if you if you tell him you're liking this profile, then he'll, oh, well, this barrel over here. You know, this barrel is creamy. This mm-hmm. barrel's got that finish. Well, there was two barrels that were very notable uh, on his note sheet when we were there doing the pick. One was Bruce's barrel, and he called it Twix. You know, he thought it was just tastes like candy. Um, another one was one that he's, you know, he said, we get tons of like red fruits and berries and, you know, it's just kind of a unique uh, mm-hmm. finish, you know, not something we get all the time. And so we went through and, you know, we tasted a few barrels and we picked one barrel. We picked two barrels that day, one very traditional Russell's big flavor spice. And then we ended up also picking the berries and we, we did it through a blind. Uh, it wasn't everybody's at first cause it was kind of different than the other Russell's that we were tasting. Uh, kind of like we said here on the blind, sweeter, you know, didn't have as much spice. Um, the finish didn't, uh, I, the order I definitely think benefited uh, what we did a little bit as far as how it worked out because your all's is spice forward. I think that was premeditated. Uh, uh, <laughs> berries is, is sweet. And then we're coming the, into your home turf. Wait till you come back to our bar. Well, the actual the actual third one here is the barrel that we passed on. It's actually the Twix barrel that Toddy's picked. Uh, so we okay. passed on the Twix barrel that day uh, because we just, we chose berries over it and we did our more traditional Russell's. Uh, but the Toddy's uh, Twix barrel gained a lot of a Appreciation that people were spending a ton of money on it, and is I mean you can taste it's a very enjoyable sweet mm-hmm. uh, pour, and that's 
Sweet like that, candy was that you? Story. you? We you is Toddy's. You is the Toddy's. Yeah, Toddy's. All right. That is the Twix barrel. That uh, so we we got Go to taste Guthrie. this one in yeah in the Rick House. But yeah, I mean, I think anybody that got any one of these three picks has got to be tickled. They're all delicious. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's always you You're know. There's no them. losers in a three store pick blind of Russell's Reserve. Don't patronize us. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a loser, but we weren't going to bring it up. Now, I mean, I, I, would, I mean, I would drink. I mean, obviously, all say we're is, zero for one right now. I know. on top, right? So we're, <laughs> okay. we're yeah. for one. We're, we're coming we're back for round two. Yeah. All right, we'll type around two. So we'll, we'll move these out Push of the way. Push them all to the center. <laughs> so if you hear some glasses move around. That would be why. Right. If you want to, you can just uh, mix all these together, and then we have. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start yeah. an infinity what, bottle. In there. Yeah, there there an go. infinity bottle of wrestles yeah. with all these, right? So spicy cool. Twix berries. berries. It would but be just a right. reset. Eat the <laughs> tortilla chips. Jimmy's yeah, so, Twix berries. Yeah, Jimmy Twix berries. So um, four roses, snack of tortilla chips. <laughs> so there was something that Jake did bring out for everybody here, which is a, a palate cleanser. Um, you know, when you guys are doing these. Um, he he brought out some tortilla chips. Um, is is tortilla chips something that you usually try too, or is it, um, or, or do you just say like I don't need no just water. Well, like what what, what do you what do you all usually go to? I think it depends on what the purpose of the tasting is. Uh, when we're doing single barrel picks, I mean the idea of corn chips is that you're supposed to kind of clear you out. You know, people do the smelling of their hand or arm to kind of clear their nose before they smell barrels. At home, I typically try to cleanse my palate with more bourbon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like that always works. I always enjoy tasting more bourbon after more bourbon. Right. So there's never a wrong way, but I mean, water suffices most of the time. Yeah. I guess I should probably keep these lids on top so, so they, they hold the aromatics in a little bit, but we'll see what this is like. So we've got um, another lineup now. So we've got, it looks like, uh, Either S or X, and then is that a two or an N? I don't know, Jeremy. You got horrible penmanship. <laughs> it's hard. To this could be a Y or an H. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, backwards. Uh, it's y, X, and Z. Y, X, and Z. Okay, cool. We'll, I'm missing a Z. All right. I think um, your Z is backwards. Or no, I have a Z. I'm missing a y. y. right over here. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Doesn't Z go the other way? Am yeah. I, is that is that not a really jagged S? It's okay. All right. Flip it upside. Oh, I've said it when you wrote it. Yeah, when you wrote it, it was a Z. I got it. (laughs) Public schools, right? No, I'm kidding. (laughs) I didn't have a mirror to look at it. Uh, It's okay. So, you know, I guess uh, another question, Ben, I'll throw it to you is, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're going into blind tastings as well, you know, Paul had kind of said like, you know, his mentality going into it. Like, do you, do you have a specific way that you do these at home? Um, I mean, do you have your wife? Uh, or a significant other, uh, your dog, whoever, go pick out something, just like throw on the table for you and just say like, I'll come back and try them. Like, we'll try this out. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point-of-sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point-of-sale system, or use Shopify's point-of-sale Go Mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award-winning 24-7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. I guess uh, another question, Ben, I'll throw it to you is, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're going into blind tastings as well, 
you know, Paul had kind of said like, you know, his mentality going into it. Like, do you, do you have a specific way that you do these at home? Um, I mean, do you have your wife uh, or a significant other, uh, your dog, whoever go pick out something, just like throw them on the table for you and just say like, I'll come back and try them. Like, we'll try this out. Well, um, and obviously today, I mean, I think these are kind of strategic as far as groupings of proof or types of barrels. I think that's really where it comes down. I mean, if you're doing, uh, one of the purposes of a blind sometimes is to remove those bias. Like maybe you're trying a bottle that's $400 on secondary against a $50 store pick. Yeah. And you're trying to remove that bias to value in your head, mm -hmm. you know, cause you want to believe the bottle that was $400 is better. Yeah. Like, Everything you believe inside of you says that. Um, but also, I think that like proof groupings is a huge thing. Um, so, do you, you do know, by mash bills as well, like similar mash bills? I mean, I like to have as many similarities as possible as far as like that's kind of like the single barrel project or single oak project. You mm -hmm. want to remove as many variables as possible and find the superior example of it. But I think that sometimes it's good to have like maybe you say, you know what, I'm a barrel proof guy but you only ever taste barrel proofs. So maybe you line up some Russell's or Knob Creek's or, you know, different ones that are maybe cut just a little bit. And maybe you end up picking those, you know, like, well, I thought I was a barrel proof guy, but right. I like other high proof bourbons that maybe have been cut. Um, so I think it's important that people maybe it's, I mean, if I don't know at all what I'm getting, if my wife does my blind, the first thing I try to pick out is identify what I think the proof is. Uh, Cause I want to keep that fair. Like, cause people, I, I think mix up smooth mm -hmm. and proof. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I've never had an 80 proof bourbon that wasn't kind of smooth. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't mean it was good. It was just 80 proof bourbon. Yeah. I like how Bill Thomas says they're, when they do reviews or anything or picks, they can't, you cannot use the word smooth <laughs> in any, any description whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's fair. And so, I mean, typically I'll first, you know, nosing is obviously the first thing you're doing to taste anything. But then as I go through, when I'm judging them against each other, I try to keep it in relativity to what I think the proofs are. Um, and then it's kind of just what you like. Uh, and then I think even after the results, you can sometimes rectify your decision, you know, when you find out <laughs> what they are. But, oh, well, it makes sense that that tasted better yeah. due to the proof difference or age difference or whatever it is. And that doesn't necessarily disqualify. Like our last one, there was no disqualified picks. They were all great. And it was easy to see how we – we literally had one that was named after candy that ended R3. <laughs> right. So it was super sweet. Like, it makes sense. Like, so you can kind of understand where you land on a blind after you find out. But we landed there organically. Mm -hmm. And then we were able to understand why we got there after we found out what they were. So that's kind of like a... It makes you feel good. Like you didn't just go out of left field and say, <laughs> right. Yeah. I think it was kind of funny that we all unanimously said it too, right? Yeah. Like we all, we all came to the same exact agreement and I don't think there was a whole like a lot of bias or influence that came into it. I but always follow group think. So yeah. whatever you all think is best here, I'm going to vote with you guys. Follow the leader. Yeah. <laughs> so are we starting with Y or Z? Uh, yeah. Start with Z since that oh, was yeah. the first yeah. one that came out. So we'll, yeah. we'll start with the next, the next grouping here. Um, but you know, Paul, I want to ask you another question. Uh, ben had brought up a, something good about, you know, trying to pick out a, a proof level when you're doing these blind tastings and try to like set that the baseline. Uh, have you ever done something that's like a, a bottled and blind or bottled and blind? <laughs> bottled and blind. <laughs> you, what if you are bottled and blind? No, uh, a bottled and bond blind tasting where you say like, we're going to do all 100 proofs. Like it doesn't like, we you know, it's going to be a hundred proof. Um, who knows? Yeah. I mean, is that, have you tried something like that too? Uh, I think we've tried just about everything, but uh <laughs> I think, you know, when you get into that situation, you're looking for, like, complexity. You're looking mm -hmm. for what, you know, the flavors that you like or that stand out to you the most. Um, because, again, like Ben said, if you're at 100 proof, everything's going to, you know, be semi-drinkable uh, yeah. at that point. Um, nothing's going to, like, choke you to death because it's so hot or, or anything like that. So I think you, at that point you're just going to go for complex, big, you know, flavor profile, enjoyable bourbons. Mm -hmm. So I got a question for you guys because I've done some barrel picks for liquor stores. Do they – and sometimes they try, you know, they – sway you to pick a certain way because they're like this one's gonna sell or that's you know versus sure. us whiskey geeks like something you know a little more you know got some more um for you know off unique. the, pro off yeah, the off profile, the profile yeah. or whatever so uh, i personally uh, I, I feel obligated to pick to the audience um because like if we're picking for our group or like a barrel that's through a store that's going to predominantly go to our group well then you don't have to go to the standard kind of releasings or easy drinking. But if you're picking a, a Buffalo Trace that's going to be sold, like I, I pick barrels for a store locally that is located on campus. Well, most of their, their demographic <laughs> is college kids. Uh, I, I can speak. It's Kentucky Tavern and Kentucky Gentleman, right? That's, that's what, uh, so and Coke what, right next to yeah. So <laughs> if I'm picking a Buffalo Trace that's 90 proof, 
I don't want to pick the spiciest Buffalo Trace that's ever been picked because that doesn't even make sense. They didn't buy 90 proof Buffalo Trace because they love spicy bourbon. But if you were picking that for a bourbon group, Mm -hmm. well, they might love this super spicy Buffalo Trace. And so I think it's a disservice to only pick to your profile because you aren't buying the whole barrel for yourself. Uh, so, that's a good point. Uh, so I try to pick to but you should a combination. <laughs> you can. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so like the picks that we do, I think, and that's also your picking team. I think represents a certain palette, and like so, if your palette is generally the same as most other people, then people are going to probably like your picks. We were having me and Jam were talking earlier. Like, if everybody that picks your barrels loves rye whiskey only. Well, they even are going to pick a bourbon that they like, but that may not be a bourbon that all the bourbon guys like. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's where everything's so subjective. They weren't wrong. Yeah. They picked the best barrel for them. And so I think that's where it kind of comes into self-awareness of maybe not even picking what you would want to drink sometimes over what is most palatable for a certain store. And I think it's tricky. Right. It's a fine yeah. balance. For sure. All right, so let's talk about this first one real quick. So we tried Z. Um, for me, like, I smelled it. I got, like, plum and a lot of, like, dried fruits. I thought it was actually very enjoyable. I got cigar um, smell on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm and you got, you got, I think Jeremy was putting his ashes in there while we were up at the bar, right? Um, no, I, kind of the same thing. Dried fruits, you know. I get citrus on it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I really like Z. I, I thought, I mean, yeah. you could tell, I'm sure, maybe I'm completely wrong. I'm sure this is probably going to be the Buffalo Trace round, right? Because it's it feels like oh, it's yeah. a little bit lower in proof. Yeah. Um, but I really enjoyed Z. I thought it was I thought it was very, very good. I mean, it didn't have a super long finish, which uh, most ninety proofs won't. Right. But, but I think for for what it is, like it, it has a lot of those uh, fruit characteristics that I yeah, usually enjoy finding in, in one. So yeah. uh, moving on to X uh, next. I'm like trying to it's, it's always hard to nose in a in a rock glass. You're it's like you're actually it was uh, listening to HQ the other day. Um when you're breathing, uh, do you know what the predominant gas is that you're breathing in? Carbon. No. <laughs> it's not oxygen either. It's nitrogen. Nitrogen. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I learned that. So now now you know when you're going through that nitrogen is, is something that you're predominant. Now we're also a random fact show now, by the yeah. way. So <laughs> Yeah. So who's tasted X so far and kind of give your thoughts? I'm just smelling. See, X is like very good, but very, very sweet to me. Like, hmm. I'll be honest. Between Z and X, that's actually pretty hard. Um, I think the battle between all night, like, obviously we've, we've kept things to barrel picks in general. I think when you line up three 90 proof of one expression, the, I, I expect the differential to be very small. Yeah. Um, but... I think the finish was a little longer on, on Z. On Z. A, or I thought I thought the finish was on longer Z. on Z. Yeah, sorry, Z. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I do think X may have been a little sweeter, and I think sometimes sweetness just kind of muddles out those other flavors. You know, you just you lose yeah. it because it's so sweet. So I mean, extremely palatable and good, uh, but I, I, the finish wasn't as long for me. Yeah, right. I, I agree. I mean, it's her group mentality. So who knows? <laughs> I'm right? Falling the leader. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna try X one more time, and then we'll we'll move on over to Y, because we're gonna go in backwards order here. You better recognize how this how much you don't taste enough low barrel or low proof stuff because we taste so many barrel bombs. Yeah, uh, that, Jeremy does bring up a good point. <laughs> yeah, um, it's 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 almost yeah, our, it's like our palates are ruined, not ruined, but it's so subtle. Yeah, it's so light. It's it tastes so light, you know. Yeah, well, and I'm, and so I'll ask you guys, like, have you ever done a a barrel proof lineup, right? And trying to go back and forth. And is that harder or easier doing a blind versus something that is a, a 90 or something that's a Russell's that's like a 110? Like, where do you, where do you find that? What do you think is the happy medium there between barrel proof to 90 to 110? Like, I think that distillery choice comes in to a big lineup there because obviously if you're talking about all barrel lineups from Knob Creek that are going to be 130 to 140 proof, you know, from the barrel, that's a little different than if you're tasting straight from the barrel at, Russell's or most MGP barrels. I mean, if you're talking about MGP, you're going to land in that 105 to 120 range 90% of the time. Uh, so I think distillery to distillery has a big jump yeah. as far as what you get. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I've done plenty of, I mean, 
I, I try to keep a sample if I can of every barrel that I go on because um, I like to see how much it changed with water. I think the hardest thing about picking a good 90 proof is you're tasting yeah. barrel proof bourbon. Like, why do they even let you? Like, I mean, we want to taste it at barrel proof, but why do they even give us that option? Like, yeah. go in there and scientifically cut it to 90 proof for me so that I don't fall in love with one at barrel proof and it doesn't respond well to water because that, that's happened too many times. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody knows a guy that went on a, a Knob Creek pick and loved it at 138 proof, thought it was the, one of the best bourbons they've had all year. And then they got it at 120. Like, man. Is not the same yeah. bourbon, right? Uh, and so I think that. It's so what do, you, what do you do? You carry a flask in? Like how do you, how are you walking away? You got to you got to you got to share the secrets of how you're walking away with these samples. Well, what I'd like to say is uh, there's a fifth. <laughs> I plead the fifth, and I'm not going to incriminate myself on my tactics. <laughs> but uh, if you'd like to sample some of our barrels from straight from the barrel, you can come yeah, back. There we to the go. House. I'm going right. to be like, watch out for Ben. Yeah. yeah. So he carrying in, bring a rum. I did get you. shut down at one of our last picks oh, uh, yeah, did. with grand fashion. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't work out. That's funny. All right. So let's, um, God, this is, I'm going to tell you what, this is tough. Yeah. yeah pepper, I think um, Y has the best nose for sure. Y, and Y to me is the best finish out of all of them for me. It just, sits. I think it's the biggest front. Yeah. I'm, I agree. I'm going back and starting from the beginning. So I'm going with Z again and I'll hit X and I'll hit Y again. But, um, yeah, Y just hits you in its stays. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty big. For I mean, especially when we're talking about low proof, I mean, it's more, I think it's got a little bit more viscous to it. Like, it is, sticks around your mouth a little bit more. I don't I like that watch, word, viscous. I don't only watch the legs when we're when we're drinking uh, out of rocks glasses, but I don't really compare them. Normally, I'm a snob, but I try to look at that and see that I haven't really paid close attention to see what I thought had more legs, but that one tastes like it has legs. What does the legs do for you? Well, that's a finish. Yeah, it's, well, that's normally how oily it is. So when gotcha. you when you swirl it around, like a, you see those those thick long lines on your glass, that's going to be a really oily bourbon normally, and that's what sticks all over your mouth. When you're, <laughs> 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 you know, that's what you know we get. That's radio gold for the podcast. <laughs> yeah. And so, Paul, I'll, we're I'll, still waiting know, for that song breakout. Yeah, <laughs> has it been thirteen minutes? Yeah, uh, no, we're, 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 we're past that. Uh, Paul, another question for you. You know, when you're when you're going on these barrel picks. Um, and one of the things That's that tough one. is is a kind of a recent phenomenon is the whole thing of NCF. Uh, we want an NCF. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you got to ask it for name, you know, by name when you go to Buffalo Trace. Uh, you go to Russell's, it's, it's just all. always NCF. Um, what do you what do you think is the the attraction there? Or do you think it's just a bunch of hoopla and hype and then it's just kind of like just let people just think whatever they want to think? Uh, I kind of think it's um – a little bit of a bandwagon type of thing, um, because the only way to really know the difference, uh, from my understanding, is that you'd have to have the exact same bottle that was NCF in the same barrel uh, that was also non-NCF. And I don't think that's ever been done. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I honestly, maybe for like color-wise and stuff, I don't really think it would change the flavor. Um, but I mean, I could be dead wrong. I don't honestly have no idea. I think it's more of a bandwagon thing. Somebody was like, "Hey, you can get, you know, X amount of dollars more if you put NCF on this," and that's what they do. Mm-hmm. I think the idea is kind of the same thing where people love barrel proofs. It's the untouched thought process, and like, so when they hear sure non-chill filtered, they think of it as being a less tampered with right. product. So therefore, I must like it more. And um, you know, the whole reason that chill filtering is a thing is because they don't want your bourbon to look cloudy when you chill it. I mean, that's what it all comes down to. It's a lower proof bourbon. When you put it in the freezer, if you're not a bourbon guy and you do that anyway, <laughs> you know, then it, it gets cloudy if you have a non-chill filter bourbon because it has these lipids and oils that are still in it. Mm-hmm. And they only show up when it's really cold. But does that change the profile? Well, like, the like you said, it's never actually been done. Right. The same single barrel, <laughs> side by side. And so it, it's not a fair comparison to take two OWA barrels and one's NCF and one's not and taste them side by side because they're both single barrels. They're going to be different anyway. We're tasting side by side products now. We're having a hard time telling the difference yeah. between them. I'm, I'm well, now's, really the, now's the moment of truth, though. <laughs> yeah. So, right. Take your horse. Uh, yeah. So what, what do you, Ryan, where, where do you kind of stand? All right. So X, I'm eliminating. It just doesn't do it for me. But uh, it's just too sweet. Not much finish for me. But Z and Y, I, I literally have gone back and forth and I cannot like distinguish the two. I don't know. I, I initially think Z, but I don't know. It's, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guys decide. <laughs> uh, so Paul, where are you where do you stand right I'd now? I'd go with Y. It would be my favorite of the you know, and then followed by Z and then X because I agree yeah. with you. X just it's you very know, sweet. It's, it's super sweet and not a whole lot of finish. All right, Ben. Man, we better not go over two. <laughs> <laughs> where do you where do you stand, Ben? 
as we're going back, th- I mean, they're less differentiable than I thought they were the first time through when yeah. I go back to Z and Y. Um, give me one more last. It's like you got you got you almost like coach your mouth and then you like hit them hit them real quick, right? Yeah, right. So. I, I think if I if you relabel these, I might pick them reverse three times. I'm gonna go with Z. Uh, I think it's got a little bit more like on the mid part. That part like right after you swallow it, before you really get to the finish, like that part's still on your tongue. I feel like that lingers just a little bit more on Z. And I mean, I always want to taste my bourbon, so I don't like it when it goes away too fast. I'm not a short finish guy. So. Jeremy, are you sure these aren't the same? Just <laughs> <laughs> make it sound like complete jackasses talking about this job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Tasting. No, awesome. I, yeah, I think I'm. Z, but by a slim margin. It's slim yeah, margin, but yeah. I would, I would, I would easily put Z up there. Honestly, I don't know. I, I didn't mind X too much. I don't know. I didn't hate. X no, all. I didn't hate. Um, just... I think mine go, might go Z X Y. Um, but I think I, I think Z was the winner for me. So, uh, Jeremy, let's right. let's hear who was. We've got three Buffalo Trace All Store picks. We've got uh, Tipsy Buffalo um, pick out of Liquor Mart Nicholsville by Bluegrass Tipsy Buffalo. We have the. Collaboration pick of Bourbon Pursuit, and we have the Bourbon Review uh, Magazine's uh, 2017 pick. Okay, so and let's let's start off with uh, everybody. Most people didn't like X as much. So, what was X? Oh, I like this bourbon a lot. Oh man, it was ours. <laughs> it was ours. Oh, so that was the Bourbon Community <laughs> Round Table one. Well, that's. I, wow. I, I put it. I put it second. We're not airing this. I like, to, I like to reiterate though. The whole the whole point was that all three were so good. Like there yeah. wasn't like a huge difference between. And these. importantly, they're all better than regular buffalo. Absolutely. I think I, mean, I, nobody I would. I think if we had lined up a fourth mm-hmm. that was just off the shelf buffalo trace, <laughs> it would have clearly lost like by a wide margin because right. these are all superior barrels. And why? What's why? why? Why is Bourbon Reviews 2017 pick? And that means that the Tipsy the Buffalo, Buffalo damn, comes out a a legend. and actually wins the blind. Actually deserves its recognition in the bourbon world of. I can't even take a bow. I'm sitting. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's amazing. I, I I'm surprised that's how it worked out. That's yeah. really cool. Well, I just uh, think that that goes. This, I mean. Had the same barrels been laid out in front of us on your day and vice versa, we probably picked the same barrels. Like we're all bourbon yeah, drinkers, we have this. similar palates. We need to do this at Kenny's house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so like I mean, if, if we had we been laid out the barrels that you all got, we probably picked your barrel. You know, it, it was probably by far the best barrel that day. And I mean, that's a, that's my whole thing is there's so much luck involved. Oh, I yeah. mean, it's easy to take it to your head, but like, well, we picked the best, but. It's, I mean, we can only pick the best barrel put that's in front a, of that's us. Right. And so there's so much luck involved in the best barrel picking mm-hmm. that it's it's hard not to take that. Well, I don't want these. <laughs> Sorry, we got we got one more, right. one, yeah, more, one more round here to, to kind of go These through here. And it, things to this do. is yeah. the only show of the day. They act like they've already recorded somewhere today. <laughs> <laughs> so this is we got we got one more to go through. And yeah. and as Jeremy brings these out, the one thing that I know our audio listeners can't see is that this one is uh, significantly probably darker, right? Oh. So. Oh, yeah. We're gonna be we're gonna be looking at probably a um, if, if if my memory serves me correct it's probably a barrel proof MGP um, which I kind of want to you know we've talked about it before on the show uh, you know Paul I'll kind of get your your take on this uh, Ryan said it before and it says like you know in the is there is there any way that you can get a barrel proof single single barrel anymore that isn't MGP like? Is there anybody else on the market that that offers something like that that um, that's outside of MGP? Four Roses, Four Roses is one, yeah. Four yeah, but I mean, that's it's. I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's very. I don't. know. Four Roses is a little bit different. I think it's a huge profile difference, right? Well, um, I think that that's actually part of their hard time and like why some of their picks don't get kind of huge recognition. You have ten recipes, right? And even I, I guarantee you. I mean, we all hang out with huge enthusiasts, right? I mean, like. We're all bourbon geeks. Yeah. And a high percentage have never had all 10. Mm-hmm. And they may own hundreds of bottles and have never tasted all 10 Four Roses. I think it's a lot of variety for people to try to sort through to know what they like. Um, so it is different. I mean, MGP, you think high rye, low rye, barrel proof. You know, you've got obviously your smooth amblers, your Boone counties, your OKIs. You've got some mm-hmm. options out there that are barrel proof options. But I, I mean, obviously there are fewer single barrel choices at barrel proof outside of MGP. But I think that's because your smaller operations have to offer 
right. the experience. I mean, what what do they have? They don't have volume. They don't have low cost. So they're trying to give you the experience of single barrel barrel proof. You know, everybody else has huge volume, you know, low cost because they are the manufacturer, the ager, the bottler. And so I think that's why you see more people that source from MGP offering what we want is because they have to please us because they need us. Like they, they need yeah. our market support. Mm-hmm. Well, look, there's a demand in the market for that, I think. And because the big distilleries are now, you know, they're not offering those anymore. And so it's, and it's this it's, is our only option. And that's what, that's when you get the, the one-offs, the, the mic drops of the world, the, you know, the Boone counties and some other things that these are, I mean, they basically say that they are barrel proof MGP. Like that's the only ones that are on the market. Right. right. Um, so you don't, you don't see that coming from, Heaven Hill, you don't see it coming. I mean, of course, Four Roses, uh, but a lot of those are private picks, right? It's not a standard offering, right? That's right. that's the weird thing is that um, it's just not a standard offering that you can always just find on the shelf. Yeah. Um, Your smaller distillers, you'll find it at too. Like Bell Mead does it, their store pick. Bell Mead, yeah, Bell Mead is, all, a, is, a, is a good one as well. Your small guys. But they're still some MGP. That's MGP. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, it's another example of MGP. Right. But yeah. as the, I think as your smaller guys hit their four year marks, as uh, Wilderness Trace and all those Wilderness Trail, guys, yeah. uh, Wilderness Trail hits those four year marks, you're going to start saying because that's how they're going to make their splash in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, Just come here and get a barrel proof single barrel store pick. As, I mean, even like Barrel House, I don't know if you all have ever dealt with them downtown Lexington and Manchester. We just passed them and on the way here. We were like, <laughs> yeah. Who are these guys. <laughs> Every, I mean, like, it just shows like how we're all kind of in it encapsulated in time. Like you don't realize how much time has passed. They have ten year distillate of their own now. That uh, they don't have much of it, but you know they're trying to figure out what they're going to do with the ten-year release of their own distillate. So I think it's an Probably exciting time. And sell it is a smart idea. But, well, yeah. uh, <laughs> whatever, fifteen years. <laughs> you know. uh, but I, mean, I think it's fun. To, we're going to start to see a ton of these guys that we think of as non-distiller distributors are really coming to time now, where we're going to have a ton of new product yeah. on the market that we don't know who's going to have. I mean, we all talk about like, you know, you've got Brown Foreman's banana barrels and you've got, you know, I, I get tons of uh, circus peanuts on single barrel um, Jim Beam. I haven't like, heard that one in a while, circus <laughs> peanuts. Huh? Uh, but you get, uh, you get these different notes, but like it's fun to wait and see what kind of notes we're going to get from all these new people entering the market. It's going to be a fun time, I think, the next couple of years. And so uh, while we're – so we, we have our, our next lineup right here, uh, and these are OKIs, if I'm not mistaken, right? Well, uh, Oh, they're, these are not the OKIs. One of them is an OKI. One one's so not. Got, uh, so possibly we'll, two MGPs we'll, going so, against each other. Yeah, we'll, we'll go against it. Um, but so not a lot of people have had a chance to go and pick a barrel from OKI. So, Paul, give us some – if you were there on it, kind of give us your your impression of, of what that is in comparison to, say, Wild Turkey when you go and you try – 12 barrels buffalo trace when you're like you get the four to choose from in front of you like that's it uh when you go to somebody that's uh straight up ndp i mean they are distilling uh now but they don't really have any of their new their distillate out uh but what is what is that process and how is it any different um well that was very special because they were just so welcoming that i I don't think you can find a better group of people um to you know host you in bourbon at all uh, they were super friendly. They, you know, took us on an awesome tour. Um, they even let us taste some of their actual, like, distillate that they had. And, and it was very good uh, for four years. I mean, um, but, I mean, you're not in the Rick House. You don't get, you know, the smells and stuff of the Rick House while you're tasting the room. But, I mean, obviously, uh, that doesn't, you know, mean everything because the, the barrels that we picked were absolutely phenomenal. Mm-hmm. All right. So, I don't know if anybody's had... S yet. Like I just tried it. Yeah. I yeah. would, I don't know what you guys called this one. I would have called it coconuts because <laughs> that's, I, I got a lot of coconut. This may not be our pick. It, I mean, I got a lot of coconut flavor out of this one. Um, I thought it was, I'm a, I'm an almond joy guy myself. So I, I love, I love, I love that kind of flavor profile. Um, what, what do you all think about S so far? I'm a uh, fan guy. It's probably the best thing we've had today. <laughs> I think it um, is. It'd be the highest I, I'm with you. I, sure. I was thinking like of a very, like, uh, Probably along the lines with a coconut, like a pina colada, almost kind of like, <laughs> type. Actually, flavor. that's very much a coconut. <laughs> that's, I know, that's, that's pretty much coconut, but you know, but you got a lot of those cherry flavors and the oranges and stuff as well in there. I think mm-hmm. for me, New yeah. Riff was also the only place. And correct me if I'm wrong on this, because we've done a few barrel picks now. But aside from Wild Turkey, um, New Riff was the only place we got to actually have the tasting from the master distiller, mm-hmm. right? 
Um, Everybody else we've dealt with a representative or a, a well, I mean, person. when you go to New Wild Ripley. Turkey, there's well, always Jimmy or Eddie there, right? Right. Yeah. Eddie was, Eddie did do but it. aside from Wild Turkey, New Roof was the first time the Master Distiller took us through the whole tasting process, and, which was kind of cool. Which he hates the name Master Distiller. Jay Wheel was yeah, like, I don't I like that term, which I think that it's, it's a funny change because like when you look back when Jimmy became Master Distiller at Wild Turkey, like it just meant like manufacturing foreman. You're liable like, now. You were like just you were just the manager. Like it didn't like now it's kind of this like really lofty position. Like, you travel the world. And, yeah, you're it's and, you're this ambassador of the product. And I mean, if you're not a well established company, you're also like a chemical engineer and you know everything else. But it's kind of funny to when you think about it wasn't such a lofty thing to be back in the day. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. I don't know what these are. They're so different. <laughs> I, that's what for me. Yeah. For me, I assume they're two MGP products. But, but the, the way the way I look at this, um, and, and I think a lot of bourbon enthusiasts. I don't want to use the word aficionado because I think that sounds smug. But a bourbon bourbon <laughs> enthusiast that really get into this, the way that I, I sit there and I taste these two, I sit there and say, well, what are the what are the most discerning notes? Um, you know, I tried tea. I'm like, okay, bourbon, vanilla, caramel, toffee, pretty pretty standard, right? Um, you know, and I could I could probably find tea and um, a Maker's Mark private selection. I could probably find T in a, uh, another MGP. I could find it in a Barrel Proof Willet. I could probably find that. But S, S really stood out. When I find something that has a, a such a strong presence, like that that coconut feel, I was like, yeah. that's, that's unique. Um, this is, this is a, one of those special bottles. I can, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and it's not to say that it's any better, no. right? I don't think that. I think it's just, it's unique. It's so unique, yeah. Um, and that's that's what I think is really um, awesome about this process is you don't have a label bias. So you don't have that, right? Um, sure. So that's that's what I found really cool. It tastes about. even better with a cigar. It tastes, yeah, Jake, where's ours? Jake yells at me. He's like, even better with a cigar. <laughs> well, we might we might have to try that in a little bit. We'll see how much time we have. Ben, yeah. ben made a comment earlier, too. If, if you're doing barrel, t- and I recommend everybody do blind tastings at home. So some of the most fun we'll have during the summer is when I'm barbecuing and, you know, uh, my wife will set up blind tastings for everybody. It's one of the most fun things we do in bourbon. Um, but uh, don't be afraid to, a month later, two months later, try the same lineup again and see how you all, that same group of people rank that same lineup the second time. You might be surprised. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've done that. I've only done it once. Um, and I'm very happy to say that we tasted eight bourbons and our top two stayed the same. But after that, and the field got scattered. That's a <laughs> Jimmy brings up a pretty good point. Uh, you know, Paul, I want to pick your head and, and well, uh, Ben as well. So when you are doing something blind, I mean, we, we've gone through um, seven at this point, but we we were trying to compare three at first, three eight. at first, and now two. Um, you know, he's he mentioned eight. Like, is it is it really hard to put eight against each other? Except, any, is it a lot easier to just like narrow the field? I think it's hard to put eight together because uh, I, f- I feel like after a certain point, you just burn your palate out. Yeah. Uh, especially if you're, you know, at like Russell, you know, you're picking like a Russell's barrel, you're tasting 10, you know, samples at barrel proof. You're going to burn out quick or you just be hammered drunk. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I think it's easier to, you know, pick your everyday choice um, if you're doing like two or three or, um, but when you get to eight, it gets pretty Scattered. Yeah, I was on a pick with the Seventeen IB guys at Willits, like, and Drew was like, "Guys, after ten, I'm not giving you any more because it's palate fatigue. You'll, right. you know, drinking barrel proof all day. Your palate's just gonna, you're not gonna be able to decipher the differences <laughs> anymore." So, biggest instance I've ever had of that is we actually uh, went to Smooth Ambler uh, with Ed Bly, and we were picking barrels. Um, this was we were picking our specific group was actually picking the mythical pick. Uh, Ed picked. Four barrels that day, Cleveland Bourbon Society. So you're Society behind the pick. mythical pick. I'm not behind it. I'm involved with <laughs> he it. He was there. Um, but we had Go Big Blue, Cleveland Bourbon Society, and uh, Steve Ha, who mm-hmm. most people know, picked his own barrel because uh, he's a big smooth ambler guy. Uh, but we tasted 24 barrels that day. Mm-hmm. And I've never been more scared of palate fatigue ah. than I had ever been that day uh, because we didn't pick one barrel out of all eight barrels selected out of the first 10 we tasted. Mm-hmm. And what are the statistically, you know, what are the chances that not one of the first 10 barrels you taste are going to be selected? Mm-hmm. So we were all kind of actually worried about our selections. I think everybody was pretty happy at the end of the day. Well, yeah. But we <laughs> ate whole bags of corn chips. You've never <laughs> yeah. seen more panicky, like, just scared eating of corn chips. Broken. 
And yeah. What were, what were, I mean, you were worried because when, yeah. when everything in the second group of temptation is better than the first group, you get really paranoid because at Smooth Amboy, the great thing about their pick was you just pointed a barrel and you'd go drill it and you'd get a glass and you'd spile it yourself. And you didn't know necessarily even if it was high rye or low rye. You're just like, I'm tasting that one. I'm tasting this one. Yeah. And so then you just – you're like, well, I'm drunk and I don't know if it's good. <laughs> and I'm just going to keep drinking these. But yeah. I mean, I, I mean, ultimately, we were all happy, you know, at the end of the day. But I mean, we had to wait till it came to bottling to actually figure out. To, like, did yeah. we do okay? Like, <laughs> uh, how drunk were we when we yeah. picked these? And, I mean, there were some great barrels because Ed had that 119 proof uh, cork and bottle smooth ambler that was, you know, just an awesome pick. Mm -hmm. uh, Cleveland Bourbon Society got a monster barrel that day. Uh, so shout out to those guys if they're listening. But, um, uh, those are fun because we got That's to taste with, uh, something. Lentz, right? Yeah, it's yeah, it Lentz. Uh, it, Paul, I'll, I'll run one more by you before we start uh, doing the reveal and wrapping this up. When it, it's because Ben brings up a pretty funny thing, you know, when you look at what master blenders do, you do with these people that do it on a very large scale. Uh, they do it for consistency. They do it for profile. Uh, they they put it in their mouth and they spit it out. Right? They want to get that. Um, however, the people that go and go and do these barrel picks. Um, I don't think anybody's ever spit anything out, uh, as far as my knowledge. I have poured some out. But not you maybe poured, it out. but yeah. But I mean, yeah. When you're tasting, like you don't, you don't typically do that. No. Uh, no, the uh, and so right. by the by the time you, you think you find something, you you've gone through uh, a few barrels trying to barrel proof, and you're like, yeah, this is the one. Like, do you think that it deserves more or less praise than like standard profile stuff that's on the shelf like what what do you think is like the idea behind to say like oh i and my group like we can pick something and we're out there just like having a great old time versus somebody's like whose job is in Does a lab coat day. is in a lab coat like saying like no this is the actual profile it's supposed to be <laughs> right yeah I mean, I think that it does I, because, you know, we're all in, you know, this bourbon community it's somewhere. You're, you're a member of some form of group or whatever. And I think that, you know, if you have a team of people that go on, on a certain day and you all get together and you all put your, you know, collective thoughts into a barrel and, and you all agree on it. I think that that bottle then represents your guys as, you know, as a group. Uh, as far as like having a lab coat on and just throwing some stuff together and be like, this is what it's supposed to taste like. Uh, I don't think that means quite as much. And, you know, bourbon, you know, nerds uh, are sentimental. Uh, you know, some at the end of the day, you know, they all care about one thing and, and you know, they all, I don't know, bond over it. So I think when you grab that bottle that has that group tag on it, you know, you're like, you know, I remember what we were doing this day, what we talked about, what it smelled like in the, in the Rick House or wherever. And I think there's memories in that bottle. Yeah, I think that's why it means so much. Yeah. yeah. All right, so it's time for the reveal, and um, I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna take a stab at this um, <laughs> because I. So he brought. So Jeremy brought over. I was he, not brought a, this. he brought an OKI 12 year, uh, one of their private picks. The it Ricky only Bobby had barrel. it only had um, 72 bottles in the barrel, so short barrel. Is their Ricky Bobby pick? 118 uh, and a half. Just real quick, why Ricky Bobby? Well, we were the first group that got to pick of their 12 year stock. Uh, so we actually picked two barrels that day and we tossed around a lot of names like, you know, we're the first group. What do you call it? So, you know, if you're not first, you're last, you know, we, and we also so the other barrel that we selected and you all are welcome to try it. We didn't want to line up in a blind because we knew we were stacking. But we also picked the early bird barrel and same concept. You know, we were the early birds. We got there and got to pick barrels first. So you got the worm, right? Yeah. Well, we got the barrel. And uh, if that was just the idea. If you aren't first, you're last. We just happened to be first. And that was it. You know, we just were fortunate enough to get to pick. And also we picked two short barrels that day. And so I've not seen another barrel come out as short as ours as other store picks have hit. I mean, is it, obviously, obviously we didn't know they were short barrels. So I've, I've been on barrel picks and the short barrels have always been some Better. of my favorites. So is that the same case for you all? Uh, not necessarily exclusively, but I think that obviously short barrels, I think are indicative of either movement in and out of the wood, like too much maybe mm -hmm. is the idea. And obviously wood imparts at least half the flavor. So, a short barrel it has a lot more barrel influence normally, and that's mm -hmm. normally that's why we like that's why twenty plus year old bourbons are really popular. Sure. And you know, I think that's the idea is we got more barrel influence because it was a short barrel. Mm -hmm. Right. Short barrels have made our final cut on tastings everywhere except for four roses. Four roses is the exception to the rule, but everywhere else we that's just that last four roses, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. last four roses. Was the only time the that was the only time the short barrel didn't make yeah. the make the final. And then so um, just the, the the last bottle that he brought up beside that OKI was just a standard 
it's not really too standard, but Colonel E.H. Taylor's barrel proof, uh, this was 128.1. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a stab at it, that the <laughs> S was the Colonel Taylor barrel proof and that T was OKY. Um, drum roll, please. I'll let you say because I've forgotten at this point. So – I can't do this. It's all, it's all, it's yeah, all dark thought, underneath. We can't see that. I thought T was the barrel <laughs> I thought T was the barrel proof. Yeah. You thought T was the barrel proof? Yeah. yeah. T is E.H. Taylor barrel proof. Oh, wow. Proof. Yeah. And S is the OKI. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. S is the OKI. Is yeah, the I was going to say. Okay, like, it's got a really sweet profile. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. for some reason, like, I th- I see a lot of Buffalo Trace products, and and I get a lot of those sweet characters or the sweet yeah. flavors out of it. And this that's what I, I, I thought I gravitated like, towards. No, it's the Did anybody else on the E.H. Taylor pickup, like, I get lots of, like, that dry um, citrus, kind of like a Granny Smith apple kind of citrus, yeah. like that almost tart note that you get on I there. I like, like, like I was eating potpourri or something. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think a lot that of floral, how like, much potpourri <laughs> have you eaten at well, this point? You know, <laughs> out of curiosity. <laughs> I have a weird head. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this, I, okay, I, what it, this was, it was, I tasted I, it immediately it so and it was better. just like, yeah. You know, you, you just know when you taste something good, it immediately hits and you're like, that's it. <laughs> you know, that, yeah, oh. that, that was well, that's a think, great pick. Well, I think also like people sometimes associate high rye as everything spicy and like, oh, I don't like high rye. I like sweet. Well, what I don't think they realize is that like, your high rye a lot of times yield all of those, yeah. you know, the baking spice, sweet notes that you want later. High rye young is not so sweet. Yeah, I think we had this conversation last week. Maybe. I remember this. We it's may have. Back but, to me. <laughs> but, yeah, I think once you cross that like nine to ten year range, like high rye shows itself really well. It's not – Super spicy. I mean, this is a really sweet. I mean, at 100, it, it's easy drinking at 118 and a half yeah, proof. It's very approachable. And it's it's sweet, one of those danger bourbons because oh, yeah. it's like it tastes like an 80 or 90, you know. And it, I mean, it just goes down so easy. You can guzzle yeah. this stuff. <laughs> and but I mean, it, but it, everything at OKI is the high row, pro, high rye profile because they're, you know, they're big on that whole LDI background that they came in from because, you know, they had the same training uh, when they started distilling. So I just think, I mean, like, I'm a Russell's guy. Turkey's known for being a high rye distillery. OKI is all high rye. But I just think that sometimes people close their mind. Oh, no, no, I only like sweet. Yeah. And they don't realize how sweet of profile can come from a high rye bourbon. That's awesome. So let's go ahead and close it out. Uh, you know, I, I want one more pour of this OKI because it was, it was actually <laughs> yeah. fantastic. No, 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 that's my personal bottle. Well, too, that's, too bad. <laughs> that's too bad. Then we're not going to air the episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, guys, I want to say thank you so much. I just uh, a little splash. Yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely uh, a pleasure talking that's to you good. all. Uh, there's a few takeaways to, from here. Um, one, they pick better barrels than us. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I think they just rolled out better. They've been in they it wrong. Hey, you know, I, we've I only like done the two, approach. so they're, yeah, they're, <laughs> but they did. No, there's no doubt. This was, this was a, this was a fun experiment. Uh, I mean, Maybe we can merge, you know. And yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, if you yeah. all want to come on a pick with us, we'd love to do it. We yeah. can do that. We can do, we can do a split label, right? We'll figure yeah, something yeah. out. No, no, it's still our label. We're still arguing. They don't want our name up next to that. Split, split sticker? Split sticker? Split sticker we split, I had yeah. to make two stickers? <laughs> uh, Ben's also the guy that makes all of our stickers. Yeah, there you go. yeah, I have a printing company, so it makes it... Oh, that's why so we are insistent on yeah. having fun stickers, because we have access to make things. Play some yeah. strings. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, uh, and then this all this all actually goes credit to Paul, because Paul reached out and yeah, said, you know, we, you should, so we should do a blind tasting. Like, let's put your Buffalo Trace pick next to our Buffalo Trace pick, and let's really figure this out. And, <laughs> You know, Tipsy Buffalo came out ahead. Like, kudos to you all. Like, it was fantastic. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I don't know if it does, there's no such thing as a $150 Buffalo trade. You know, <laughs> congratulations, yeah. guys. Yeah, you <laughs> made it. You did something. Um, it hit 175 just, <laughs> just to make sure yeah, we were cutting ourselves just, short. Uh, <laughs> and had any of us, like, it was, we got a little bit of flack. You know, there oh, were some people time. not happy about, with it. <laughs> I own two bottles. Yeah. You know, so it's not like we knew that we were going to about to inflate the market and go, in, yeah. you know, crazy with it. But I mean, obviously, we were happy to see people like the label. And that's 90% of the people that spent a ton of money had never tasted it, had nothing to do with what we just did today. Like the tasting that we did, mm-hmm. nobody bought it because it tastes better. Mm-hmm. They bought it because it was a fun label yeah. and they didn't, they didn't have it on their bar. And most of the people were out west and they don't know anything about bourbon. <laughs> uh, sorry, guys. No, but, no, don't don't yeah. say that. We got a lot of California <laughs> listeners. Uh, they, they, no, California is its own country now, right? And they, and they're trying to be. Yeah. <laughs> good luck. But they have a lot, of, a lot of good barrel aged beer out there. But I think we can say that for another episode. But, fellas, I want to say thank you again for, yeah, for doing this. So this um, yeah. If there's, I'll let you guys give a plug for, for anything else. If there's a way that, People can either find out more about you, about bluegrass, 
quote unquote group? Like, um, you know, kind of what does that look like? So anytime you can, you're anywhere near Nicholasville, you can stop in at Jake's Cigar Bar and Jeremy is the bartender here. And every bartender here, you know, uh, is familiar with our group. It's kind of like our uh, place that all of our members go. It's a uh, hub. It's a hub. If it you is will. a hub. Right. Yeah. Uh, so anybody that wants to know anything can either come to Liquor Mart in Nicholasville or Jake's Cigar Bar and learn anything you want to know it's about our group and our members. You know. and, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. awesome. And, and Ben, thank you as well uh, for being on here. Uh, and thank you to Jake and Jeremy for hosting us at Jake's Cigar Bar in uh, Nicholasville today. Uh, it, was a, it was a pleasure being able to come here. Uh, we can smell the aromatics in the air. He threw some Jake's cigars here on the, <laughs> on the table. He says, you know, it's hard to smoke them, guys. But, uh, you know, this was this was a fun episode. So make sure you, if you've got a friend of a friend of a friend that lives somewhere in this area, I'm sure they might be in the group. They might be able to add you. And you can at least see the conversations. My friend, I probably can't get a pick, but you can at least see the conversation. Um, and so make sure you check them out. Make sure you're also following Bourbon Pursuit on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you hear, make sure you support the show on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Bourbon Pursuit. Uh, also, if you want all the new episodes beamed straight to your inbox, go to bourbonpursuit.com and sign up for our mailing list or our newsletter. And what was that, Jake? Facebook? Jake, Jake's Facebook. Yeah, Jake's Facebook. You don't make sure you, anybody to like it. Just, just, <laughs> you don't have to know someone of someone of someone well, to like right. the page. So it's like Jake's bar, Cigar Bar. Except and, everyone all of all creeds. And please come. And it's a great place. I've had a great time here. I wish – I was thinking in my mind, what a great place. In Louisville, we really don't have a place like this where a bourbon community can come, hang out, talk to the bartenders – do a blind taste testing, you know, at the bar. I mean, this this is a set great up some play. microphones yeah. and make a day out of it. I still think it was rigged. That like, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to do this back at our home turf. Let's do, so it. let's do it. Next time y'all want to go head west on sixty four, let's let's do <laughs> yeah, this we again. can make it happen. No, but this yeah. was this was super fun, man. I really appreciate y'all having us. Thank you guys for yeah. having and, us. Uh, and guys, if you have any show suggestions, feedback, comments for the show, we love hearing from our our audience. So please keep that coming, and we'll uh, see you next time. Mm-hmm.